In recent years, with advancements in science, some long-standing mysteries and unsolved crimes have been solved. But there are still many that perplexed investigators and left unanswered questions that still linger to this day. We all know about high-profile cases like Jack the Ripper and the Black Dahlia, but in this episode we bring you five lesser-known cases that are just as intriguing and still remain unsolved to this day. Now before we begin, we'd like to say a special thanks to this video's sponsor, Skillshare. A thirst for wisdom and learning is vital to improving our lives. Ultimately, we are teachers here at Top Fives, hoping to educate our viewers and motivate them to seek out that wisdom. One such method is unlocking new skills, similar to unlocking Earth's wonders or solving an unresolved mystery. While resolving mysteries is never a guarantee, honing a new skill to develop our individuality is. And with our continued partnership with Skillshare, we are honored to give you a jump on that chance to find wisdom. Skillshare is an online instructional platform built by creatives for creatives. Skillshare provides unlimited digital classes for subscribers from all walks of life. Whether it be an artistic background or someone who seeks new mechanical skills, these classes give simple yet detailed deep dives into subjects like animation and photography, or more technical topics such as business analytics and marketing. The best part is you can use Skillshare even as an amateur. The program is created for those trying new skills for the first time and allows you to switch through subjects seamlessly. Top 5's fans love to ask how we utilize stock footage in our videos, and via Skillshare, we found a fitting lesson called Creative Video Storytelling and Editing, Making the Most of Stock Footage, taught by Nikki Stevens. Nikki does an incredible job showing you how to capture an audience without ever needing to pick up a camera, giving out amazing editing tricks and how to be savvy with simple stock footage. Through our sponsorship, the first 1,000 subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of the premium membership. And if you love it as much as us, you can sign up for just $10 a month on an annual membership after the trial ends. With fresh ad-free lessons and a generous amount of premium courses added each month. So no more waiting for that hunger for knowledge to fill itself. Join Skillshare today and gain the wisdom to improve the creativity in your life. And now, hit those lights, sit back and enjoy. The Mysterious Disappearance of Little Pauline Pickard In April 1922, two-year-old Pauline Pickard disappeared whilst playing outside her home in the village of Goas al Ludi in the region of Brittany in northwest France. Her frantic parents gathered the locals who searched the family farm and surrounding area for clues to Pauline's whereabouts, but despite around 150 people joining the search, they turned up nothing. Pauline's family feared she had wandered off and either died of cold or was eaten by a wild animal. Although it was strange, no trace of such an attack or the little girl's body was found. Rumors started to spread through the village that Pauline had been abducted by a chimney sweep who had recently visited the area. Others speculated she had been stolen by passing travelers or by two strangers that had been spotted loitering around the Pickard's farm at the time of Pauline's disappearance. However, despite extensive inquiries and searches by the police and volunteers, no trace could be found. Then about a month later, the police arrived at the Pickard's farm, carrying a photograph of a little girl who had been found wandering alone in the city of Cherbourg, over 200 miles away. A few days before the girl was found, she was seen with a scruffy woman who had tried to leave the child in a store before being chased down by the owner who gave the child back. Pauline's parents looked at the photo and were relieved to see it was their little girl, and her mother burst into tears, saying that's my daughter. Not long after, they boarded a train to Cherbourg, excited to be reunited with Pauline and bring her home. However, when they first saw her, they were not convinced it was their daughter. The girl didn't recognize them, and their unusually chatty daughter didn't say a word. When they spoke to her in their Breton language, she appeared not to understand. The parents spent a few days with the girl and were soon convinced she was in fact Pauline. When asked by reporters if they were sure, the father replied, of course, she has the same hair and the same blue eyes. The girl was allowed to leave with the Pickards and doctors hoped that once she was home, her normal surroundings would spark her memory and get her talking. On the way home, the girl spoke three words in Breton, further convincing the parents that the girl was Pauline. 
But when they returned to the farm, Pauline's siblings did not recognize the girl as their sister, and the family as a whole started to have their doubts about the girl's identity. Just a couple of weeks later, at the end of May 1922, a farmer was crossing a field about a mile from the Pickards' farm, when he discovered the horribly mutilated and decomposing torso of a small girl. Close to the corpse was a carefully folded pile of clothes that matched the description of the clothes Pauline was wearing when she disappeared. After the police arrived, they also found a severed head, although despite it being devoured by foxes, it didn't seem to match the size and features of a little girl. What was even more perplexing was that the area that the remains were found in had been searched multiple times after Pauline vanished. An examination revealed that the torso was Pauline's, and it was concluded she had died accidentally after getting lost and finding herself stranded in a storm that passed through the night, with the gruesome injuries put down to wild animals. Although strangely, her torso and stomach were intact, which were the parts of the body often eaten first by scavengers. No cause of death was determined, or an explanation for the folded clothes. In another extraordinary twist, it was revealed that the severed head belonged to an adult male who they were unable to identify. Locals found it hard to believe the reports, as they knew the area where the body was found had been searched several times. People started to speculate that the body wasn't Pauline, and that someone had planted a torso that resembled her. Of course, the big question was, who was the girl from Cherbourg? Well, sadly, no one ever found out. Not long after Pauline's torso was found, the Picard sent the girl back to Cherbourg to be adopted. The woman, who it was claimed had been trying to abandon her, was traced, although she still had her daughter with her. Suspicion soon fell on a man called Caramon, an umbrella salesman who had worked at the Picard's farm, but the case against him was dismissed due to lack of evidence. The other suspect was a local farmer called Eves Martin, who visited the Pickards when they arrived home with the girl from Cherbourg and said, Are you sure it's Pauline? God forgive me, I am guilty. Then he ran from the farm laughing hysterically, and the following day was taken to a lunatic asylum. Of course, there is another terrifying thought. After all, identified bodies in the 1920s was not an exact science, and it's therefore possible that the dead girl was not Pauline. But the girl from Cherbourg was, and her parents inadvertently sent their own child to be adopted. The Sarah Joe Mystery On the 11th of February 1979, Scott Mormon, Benjamin Calamer, Peter Hanchett, Patrick Wozner, and Ralph Malaiakini boarded a boat in the town of Hanna on the Hawaiian island of Maui for a day's fishing. The boat named the Sarah Joe was a 17-feet Boston whaler with an 85-horsepower engine. It was a basic vessel, only equipped for local fishing in calm waters. The men were all friends, had over 50 years of seagoing experience, and Ralph fished for a living. As they set off at around 10 a.m., it was a clear day and the water was calm. However, just two hours later, the weather worsened, and a major storm approached the islands. Conditions out at sea would have been horrendous, with waves up to 40 feet high, and the Sarah Joe was ill-equipped for such a storm. A number of larger fishing boats managed to stagger back to port, but there was no sign of the Sarah Joe or her crew. When the men failed to return, an extensive search was mounted, and experts even brought in homing pigeons, especially trained to locate people stranded at sea. But after days of searching, it was concluded the Sarah Joe and all on board had wrecked and sank. However, family and friends weren't so quick to abandon their hopes of a rescue and pooled their cash and resources, managing to continue the search for an extra three weeks. Although sadly, still nothing was found, and they had to accept the men were not coming back. A memorial service for the crew was arranged, which went on to become an annual event. However, over a decade later, some of the original search party members were on a routine wildlife mission around the uninhabited Marshall Islands for the National Marine Fishery Service. The islands are approximately 2,200 miles southwest from where the Sarah Joe disappeared. On the 10th of September 1988, biologist John Norton came across an abandoned fiberglass boat on the coastlines of the islands. He could only see part of the registration of the boat, but it was enough to convince him that it came from somewhere in the Hawaiian Islands. On further inspection, it was confirmed the vessel was the Sarah Joe. 
A thorough search of inside the boat threw up nothing, so Norton and his team decided to search the surrounding area. That is when they discovered what looked like a grave that had a makeshift cross made out of driftwood. Also sticking out of the shallow grave was a human jawbone. A closer look at the grave revealed some blank pieces of paper, about three inches square, resting on top of a human skeleton. All of the paper was loosely stacked like an unbound book. In between each sheet of paper was a thin silver, or silver-like metal. It was similar to a Chinese burial tradition, where small pieces of paper or paper money separated by gold or silver foil are placed in the coffin as a means of fortune for the afterlife. The team decided they had disrupted the grave enough and felt it was disrespectful to dig any more. However, they took the jawbone back for testing. Results revealed it belonged to Scott Mormon, one of the members on board the Sarah Joe. Another search of the island where the grave was found failed to yield any clues to the fate of the other four men. It also posed the question if there were no other survivors who buried Scott. It does seem likely that Mormon and the boat drifted to the area but was he the only survivor? Although how a boat as basic as the Sarah Joe could survive one of the worst storms on record and end up on a desolate atoll, thousands of miles away is a mystery in itself. Experts have estimated that the drift time between Hawaii and the Marshall Islands would have been somewhere in the region of three months. Another conundrum is that four years before Norton and his team visited the island, another research team landed there and reported nothing out of the ordinary even though a grave and a discarded boat would have been hard to miss. So the enduring question is, where was the boat between leaving Hawaii on the 11th of February 1979 and 1984 when the first research team visited the area? To date, no one has a clue, and the mystery rumbles on. Septic Tank Sam on April 13, 1977, the McLeod family returned to their former homestead in the small town of Tofield, Alberta, Canada, to look for a septic tank pump that they had left behind when they moved out of the now abandoned farm. As they opened the septic tank to look for the pump, they immediately realized something was wrong. Floating on top of the rancid water was a gray sock, but to their horror, they noticed it was still attached to a human leg. They called the police immediately, who slowly drained the tank of its putrid contents using buckets and a body was discovered. Although at this point it was so decomposed they couldn't determine if it was male or female. They also discovered that after being dumped in the tank, quick lime had been scattered over the corpse to quicken the decomposition process. Although in reality, the combination of quick lime and water caused the corpse to dry out and preserve itself longer than if it had just been left to decompose on its own. What was apparent was the body didn't get into the tank by accident, and they were looking at a deliberate act by someone. No other clues could be found around the homestead, but it was theorized the culprit was someone who knew the area as it was in such a secluded location. Once the corpse was brought back to the morgue and an autopsy was carried out, it was confirmed the body was a male aged between 26 and 40, with dark brown hair, medium build, and approximately 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 7 and likely of Native American descent, and he had been in the tank for up to 12 months. It was also revealed that he almost certainly suffered a serious illness as a child, although the illness had never been made public. The body was dressed in a blue Levi work shirt, a grey t-shirt, blue jeans, grey wool socks, and brown wallaby shoes. Early on in the investigation, the corpse earned the name Septic Tank Sam. Sam had suffered a horrific death, and was tortured before being dumped in the tank head first, with his hands tied behind his back. It's believed he was burned with both cigarette butts and a blowtorch, and had been severely beaten and sexually mutilated. The only saving grace for poor Sam was he was shot in the head and in the chest before being put in a tank, and wrapped in a yellow bedsheet fastened with a length of cord. The police had very little to work on, and despite releasing a composite sketch and dental records, no one came forward to identify the man. Eventually the body was buried in Edmonton with no name. Later the body was exhumed and DNA samples were taken, as well as detailed measurements of the man's head before he was reburied. From the measurements, the world-renowned Dr. Clyde Snow recreated a skull and a facial reconstruction was made. However, despite repeated appeals, no one came forward to identify Sam. 
The only thing anyone really knows about him is that he met a violent end and was horrifically dumped in a putrid grave, and his true identity and reasons for his death may never be known. Isidore Fink The murder of New York laundryman Isidore Fink ranks as one of the most infamous unsolved crimes of all time. Isidore Fink was one of the many immigrants from Poland that came to America at the beginning of the 20th century in search of better life. His dreams, just like many others, were never fulfilled, but one thing did put him in the history book was the way he died. Isidore was a Polish Jew who settled in New York City where he opened a laundry business he called Fifth Avenue Laundry, and he lived in rooms next door. At 10.30pm on March 9th, 1929, Isidore's neighbour saw him returning home from delivering laundry to his clients and closed his front door. About 15 minutes later, the same neighbour heard sounds of a struggle, and fearing something awful had happened, she summoned a police officer who was on patrol in the area, and they went to check Isidore was okay. However, they were unable to enter his property as all the doors and windows were locked from the inside, apart from a tiny transom window above the front door which hung with its hinge broken. A child small enough to climb through the tiny window was used to get into the home and open the door from the inside. When officers entered the home, they found Isidore Fink's corpse, shot once in his left hand and twice in his chest. The key to the door was in the inside lock. There was no sign of robbery and his business cash remained untouched. A thorough search of his home revealed no murder weapon or spent cartridges and no sign of a struggle also, the room looked neat and tidy and undisturbed. Isidore was known to be fearful of being robbed and was meticulous about keeping his doors and windows locked at all times, and he never allowed strangers to enter either his home or his business. He had no known enemies and no known girlfriend or wife, and police could find no evidence that he was being extorted by local gangsters. What officers were faced with was an apparent motiveless crime committed in a seemingly impossible manner. There was no gun at the scene, which ruled out suicide. The gunshot wound on his hand showed powder burns, indicating he'd been shot at close range. But the door and windows apart from the tiny transom window were all still locked. The only fingerprints at the crime scene were his. So how did he die? Well, that is the unsolvable question. It was impossible for police to find a motive, impossible to find a murder weapon, and seemingly impossible for anyone but a small child to get in or out of the home. To many, the murder of Isidore Fink was the perfect crime that baffled detectives then, and still does to this day. The Lake Bodman Murders On June 4th, 1960, 15-year-old Mela and Anja and their 18-year-old boyfriends, Seppo and Nils, set out for a camping trip on the shores of the beautiful Lake Bodman, near the Finnish city of Espoo. At around 6am the next morning, a group of boys who were birdwatching near the campsite noticed a flattened tent and a blonde-haired man walking hurriedly away. At the time, they thought nothing of it, until later, at around 11am, a jogger by the name of Risto stumbled upon a horrific scene and alerted the police. Anja and Seppo's bodies were found in the flattened tent, they had been frantically bludgeoned and stabbed through the tent fabric. Mela was found on top of the tent, naked from the waist down and with significant stab wounds. All three of them were dead. Mela's boyfriend Nils was also found outside of the tent. He had also sustained several injuries, including a concussion, a fractured jaw and a deep knife wound to his forehead, but he was still alive when the police arrived on the scene. After police questioned Nils, he claimed to have no memory of the attack. Although under hypnosis, he gave a description of a blonde man, and a composite sketch was released. Whoever killed the three friends stole several personal items from them, including their wallets and multiple articles of clothing. Although Nils's shoes and some of the clothing were found about half a mile from the crime scene. All of the other items missing, including the murder weapon, have never been found. At the funeral of one of the victims, a man appeared in one of the photographs taken in the day that bore a striking resemblance to Nils' photo fit. However, the man has never come forward or been identified. What do you think? Over the years that followed, police followed up many lines of inquiry and questioned many suspects, but three in particular still raised suspicion in the community. 
Local man Carl Gilstrom, who ran a nearby kiosk, was top of the list. He hated campers and children, and supposedly confessed to the murders during a drunken conversation with a friend. However, his wife gave him a firm alibi, and the police didn't believe he was the culprit. Carl had also been seen filling a well in his front yard only days after the murders, possibly hiding the murder weapon and stolen items, although police searches recovered nothing. However, when he drowned himself in Lake Bodden in 1969, Locals were convinced he was the murderer, and when his wife recanted his alibi on her deathbed, many are convinced he was the culprit. Another suspect was Hans Assmann, an alleged KGB spy and former Nazi. He became a suspect after turning up at Helsinki Surgical Hospital the day after the murders, with fingernails black with dirt and his clothes covered in red stains. Hospital staff said that he was acting very nervous and aggressive, and had even feigned unconsciousness. But other than brief questioning, the police did not pursue Asman any further, claiming that he too had a solid alibi. However, later, Asman raised some other red flags in regards to the case, when after seeing a news report about the murders, in which they released the young boy's description of the man they saw leaving the crime scene, Asman cut off his long blonde hair. For many years, Asman remained a suspect, and was even suspected of involvement in other unsolved murders. Then in 2004, the case was reopened after 44 years, and advances in DNA technology ruled Asman out and put another suspect in the frame. That person was lone survivor Nils Gunderson. According to the prosecution, a drunken Gunderson killed his girlfriend in a fit of jealous rage and got into a fight with Seppo, and that is how he got his facial injuries. He then killed Seppo and Anja in an attempt to dispose of witnesses and inflict his other injuries on himself. Despite a strong defense, Nils was convicted, but only served one year of his life sentence after a successful appeal granted him his freedom. With Nils cleared and most other suspects dead, it seems as though the children of Bodmin will never have their killer brought to justice. Today, it is settled into local legend and will have been told around many campfires to those visiting the area where it happened. The story is also featured in several internet articles, horror films, and of course, a Top Fires video. So that's it for this video. And remember, if you haven't already heard, we have a new channel solely dedicated to astronomy. If you have an interest in space, the unanswered questions of the universe, and our search for life out there, you'll love Access Astronomy. Check it out in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching.